Uh, so good evening, everyone, and, and, and welcome to uh, this event uh, put on by the people, <laughs> people for profit, uh, to discuss uh, disability issues uh, pre-post COVID, which is a bit of a mouthful in itself. And so the plan this evening, we've got two speakers after the film, and then we're going to uh, open the floor to, to questions and comments. We shall make a start if you just bear with me while I share the screen. And um, we're just going to run this short film. It's about seven, eight minutes long, I think. It's another Paralympic year, and our screens will soon be filled with images of superhumans and their incredible feats. Well, yo, right now, but what if you're disabled and not ripped like an athlete? What if barriers in the way of ordinary life make the everyday itself a Herculean challenge? In this series, we'll be meeting disabled people who want change in 2016 and who are embarking on Olympian tasks to overcome the hurdles. I always enabled me to change position and to get in and out of bed. How low can you go? enables me to get moved from any other piece of equipment I may need to be moved into. Daniel lives in Stafford with his fiancée Gemma. He's been trying to go to a college reunion in Cheltenham, but only about 15 hotels in the UK have ceiling hoists available. Anyone else can, like, just ring up and book a hotel for tonight, whereas me and Jim, we'd have to plan months and months and months in advance to get it to that point. Many hotels say they can accommodate disabled people, but few can accommodate Daniel. There are hotels that say that they're accessible, but on the face of it, quite clearly aren't. I don't think it's a lot to ask for the hotels to provide hoist. Daniel has started a campaign asking just that. His MP has raised the issue in Parliament. We live in a society today that's supposed to be everyone included in everything. So, you know... If that's the society we live in, maybe we should bring everything in line with that and make it accessible to everyone. Photography, you just have to be able to, you know, take a photo. And I just love how creative it is and also how you can use it to portray a really strong message without necessarily having to write an article or, or use words too much. Laura finishes her A-levels this summer. She wants to study photography at university, but she's struggling to find a course that's physically accessible to her. Throughout my life, I've dealt with being disabled and being different from other people. And then you get to these milestones, like leaving, leaving school and going to university, when it really kind of hits you, actually, it reminds you that actually you are different and you do have requirements. And I think recently that has been a thing in the point of you see these places, you see the courses, and the course is amazing, the facilities are amazing, but actually you can't see yourself managing. So kind of choosing the universities was definitely more focused on the access than on the photography course itself. Like her classmates, Laura would rather be worrying about other aspects of university life. I look at you know, the next person you know, in class, whatever, and I do, I do realise that it's so different, especially at the age I am now when you're going to university and everyone else is focused on, oh, that place has the best nightclubs, or that place has the best shops, or that place has the best student union, and actually, I need the best campus that's going to be accessible for me. Laura has been going out of her way to tell the universities she can't manage theirs, but even so, not all of her interviews have gone to plan. I said, just checking that there's a lift, Oh, I don't know actually, let's go and see. They tried all the lifts nearby. No, they don't go down there. No, no, only stairs down, down there. 
And that really stung me that they thought it was acceptable to host interviews in a room that wouldn't be accessible to everybody. And that just really, really made me feel like I didn't want to be there because why go into a situation where you're, going to, where you're not made welcome? I've got two boy budgies called uh, Chico from X Factor um, and Beaver's Justin Beaver. <laughs> so what I do to entertain when I leave my flat, I leave the radio on for them. They like a bit of music in the background. Suling wants to be an advocate for other people with learning disabilities. She's travelled to London to meet others who want to speak out as well. Today, they are practising. Do you think that people with learning disabilities are given enough opportunities to speak out for themselves? Uh, I don't think they give it, um, get a chance for, for, uh, for them to speak out at all, really. I think they ha they're very good, yeah. I think it's quite nervous for some people, but I think it's good to sort of have a go, really. Sue Ling is joining Learning Disability England, a new advocacy group founded by people who themselves have learning disabilities. For far too long, we've had people speaking on behalf of people with learning difficulties. And a lot of the things that what they've actually said are not what generally what people with learning disabilities want. And what we want to show to the media and to the politicians that we have a right to, to this society. <laughs> I see them learn. When they learn something new, they're really excited. They want to show everybody. And I, at the end of the day, I feel that like even if it's something really small, I've helped that child achieve something. Where is it? Yes. Zoe wants to work with children. Where is it? She's been volunteering at a nursery for three years whilst applying for paid work. I've applied for over 200 jobs and I've attended over 100 interviews. Zoe's well qualified but remains unemployed. Stop, stop, stop. Really fed up. I'm feeling really depressed at the moment because I've attended all these interviews and not getting anywhere. When were you, I, mean, I think it's due to my disability and the fact that I'm disabled. I'm not sure whether it is discrimination or not, but it's very difficult to tell, but I think it's due to my disability. Her experience has led her to become a campaigner. There are programmes that are supposed to help disabled people, but they're not helping them at all. So I decided to campaign to get young disabled people into employment. Employers need training to support disabled people into the workplace because if they get training, I think there will be a better outcome. So that, that was just a, so a short film uh, from Channel 4. It, it's four years old, unfortunately, as you said, as it said, it was uh, uh, around the last Olympics, uh, which sort of spurred what they were doing. Um, but I, I think very little has changed in that time in all reality. Uh, in my experience, um, around disabilities, and, and one of the questions is now, of course, with COVID, is is it actually getting any worse? Um, and, and there is possibly some evidence for that, actually. Um, so what I'll do now, I'll, I'll introduce our first speaker, Ellen Clifford, who is um, an author of uh, War on Disabled People, Capitalism, Welfare and the Making of a Human Catastrophe. Is that right, Ellen? Excellent, good. So that's just that's chose the name. Yeah. <laughs> it's very long. No, it's cool. It's good. Uh, so he says when it does on a tin. Uh, so uh, it's published by Zen Books in 2020, uh, and I believe it's still available uh, to to buy online. Is it? Ellen? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, she's also a member of the Disabled People Against Cuts DPAC uh, National Executive. 
So uh, an, an expert in, in all in all guises. So Helen, over to you. Oh, thanks, Ivor. Um, I really liked the title of the meeting, which was on the on the poster. You know, it said uh, disability reality, I think, mm. um, because that's actually one of the issues I tried to pull out in the book is the fact that the reality of disabled people's lives still remain so hidden. Um, and apart from mainstream society, I think disability issues are still really shrouded in a lot of myths and misunderstandings and mis perceptions um, and I think just one example of that is the fact that a lot of people associate disability with wheelchair use whereas only eight percent of wheelchair eight percent of disabled people like will need to use a wheelchair and I think that that lack of, of awareness and understanding flows from the socio-economic structures that that we live under which because they serve to segregate and exclude disabled people do present this material barrier so that mainstream society just literally doesn't see kind of what goes on in disabled people's lives and the the, the reality of that and um, another example i would say is the fact that a lot of, of people in mainstream society if they haven't had personal experience see social care services and and special uh, schools and special services as a, a place that that will help and empower disabled people they believe disabled people are safer there than in mainstream society when actually um, history and evidence shows that when you put disabled people away from the rest of society and warehouse them in that way then actually people are very very susceptible to um, abuse and the statistics on sexual abuse experienced by disabled women and people with learning difficulties are still exceptionally high and that's because uh, when you um, push people away from the rest of society and create a situation where they don't have choice and control and power over their own lives of course people who want to prey on them will be attracted to those places in uh, John Pring, who does Disability News Service, wrote a, a very long book about one uh, particular scandal um, in some residential homes. And the father of one of the people who, who was a victim said, it never occurred to me that my son would not be safe there. I assumed he would. So th there's lots of these misperceptions, as I say, about the reality of, of disabled people's lives. I think from those material barriers and separation, there um, flows attitudes that the other disabled people and also a, a lack of general familiarity that means that people generally more easily unconsciously take on board the dominant ideas in society about disability. Uh, and those ideas, of course, the dominant ideas being the, the ideas of the, the ruling class serve the interests of a society run in the interests of profit rather than people. And according to those ideas, disability is a matter of, of personal tragedy. You still hear people talking about what is wrong with, with disabled people. Being different is presented as something that's unfortunate and something to be pitied. And you had um, Zoe in the film that you just showed. And um, so I actually got Zoe in that um, in that film uh, because she'd come to me because she'd had all those experiences. Like she'd been through 200 interviews. There's no actual reason why she can't do that job. She's extremely good with children. It's just because she looks different that people think that they can't possibly give her that job. Um, and in terms of the Paralympics, so actually that, that year, it was really interesting to see that from like four years ago and, and think about that. And at that time, Deepak did actually do a campaign and we were clear that we weren't campaigning against the Paralympics as such. We didn't like the fact it was still had some sponsorship from Atos. But what we were campaigning about was the way that the Paralympics are used to obscure and distract from the reality of disabled people's lives. And the Paralympics is very much in accordance with that dominant idea of uh, disability as a matter of personal tragedy and um, being consistent with the kind of ideology of individualism that we have um, around us in, in capitalism. And of course, you've got these individual athletes competing against each other, supposedly overcoming the challenges that they face. But in reality, disability is an intensely political issue that the category of disability didn't actually exist before the rise of capitalism. And the, the book by Roddy Slorak, um, a very um, capitalist con condition, um, shows that very well. Um, 
according to the social model of disability, which is the way that disabled campaigners understand disability. So we draw a distinction between uh, impairment and illness on the one hand. So those are the conditions that we live with. Um, and, and those conditions, we're not saying that they don't entail experiences of like pain and distress, they can. Um, but we draw a distinction between those and then disability. And the way we understand disability is a layer of oppression that's imposed on us and is socially created. And that's what we have to live with on top of our illness and impairments. Um, and I think that it's a really helpful way of understanding disability. It wasn't the, the disabled campaigners, who were socialists who, who developed that, the social model never intended it to be a perfect theory of disability. And so it has been criticized over the years, but they never intended it to be perfect. What they wanted was to create a tool for uh, achieving social change. So it, under the umbrella of disability, and we describe ourselves as disabled people, not people with disabilities because we're disabled by society. So under the umbrella of disability, you have um, a huge number of different impairments and illnesses and conditions, like we all have different experiences, but we can unite under the shared experience of, of oppression. And the social model has been a really powerful uh, tool for achieving that social change um, up until 2010 when things started going backwards. But I think that since 2010, what it's done is it's been really important as a tool for analyzing and understanding what's been happening and for developing uh, as effective strategies for resistance as we can as as we can do and I think it's been useful in that way to understand the COVID experience so I would say that a lot of disabled people are still like really reeling from the the last year and and the pandemic so you know uh, at an absolute minimum estimate you know 60 percent of COVID related deaths are, are disabled people and the reason why that's a minimum estimate is the data just doesn't exist so the office for national statistics had to rely on the 2011 survey and of course a lot of people then so at that time disabled people made up 18 percent of the population whereas we're now 21 percent so a lot of people who weren't disabled in 2011 11 might be now so that's why it's a, it's a minimum estimate but the way the kind of i'd say like the the narrative ran in according to the government and within the the media is that the deaths of disabled people were like somehow more understandable it was like the deaths of the healthy people that you know we needed to be bothered bothered about and that were an indication of how serious the the pandemic was um but actually when the ons accounted for age and health related factors they still found that disabled people had died disproportionately and the reasons they gave for that were firstly about people living in care homes and secondly poverty and there is this intrinsic relationship between poverty and disability their cause and consequence of of each other and a lot a lot of you know disabled people who are in work are in those low paid frontline jobs where they would have been you know most at risk uh, and of course a lot of people living in poverty couldn't afford to shield the government has consistently refused to apply the 20 pounds uplift that they gave to universal credit to legacy benefits so there are still like two over 2.2 million uh, people still on legacy benefits and three quarters of those are disabled people and uh, disabled people's expenditures like shot up because of having to shield because you know you've got to pay for your own PPE if you've got staff coming in and out extra heating costs online deliveries often online deliveries have like minimum orders etc uh, of course like all that evidence has been presented to the government again and again and they still wouldn't apply the the 20 pound uplift one thing that, that really struck me was when the figures for people with learning difficulties, uh, the, the mortality rates came out. So younger people with learning difficulties were up to 30 times more likely to die of COVID than um, non-disabled people of the same age. Uh, and Public Health England, like, I mean, that date, I mean, that information, it, 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 it was, um, you know, it was published, it was on the radio and in the news, which I guess is good that there's publicity for it. But 
the way public health explained it when they were interviewed in those media reports was that people with learning difficulties often have comorbidities like that obese have diabetes and also they say people with learning difficulties might not be able to understand information about social distancing um, and I found that really offensive because it seemed to be sort of blaming people with learning difficulties themselves for being more susceptible um, to, to getting COVID. But there was no mention of any of like the social factors or the political decisions that meant that the, that high mortality rate was completely unavoidable in different circumstances. They didn't talk about the failures of PPE provision within the care homes and group homes where people um, are living. And of course, of course, they didn't mention the fact that, you know, that the, the Prime Minister could and should have brought in lockdown a lot quicker, a lot harder. So, you know, a lot of those deaths would would never have occurred, but in a particular relation to people with learning difficulties and autistic people living in group homes, there was no mention of the unlawful use of do not attempt DNA CPRs. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the CQC, that was something that the CQC, you know, did an investigation into because of this concerning level of, of those being written into people's medical records. Um, without consent and then there's also the issue about the treatment rationing guidelines uh, which were brought in so uh, people who were admitted to hospital whether they were able to access life-saving treatment or not was triaged according to a, a clinical frailty score um, and the higher you score on that then the less of a priority you are you are for treatment and a lot of uh, older disabled people who were admitted to hospital, it, it has since been revealed, weren't given access to intensive care, even when there were intensive care beds free due to that use over zealous use uh, of these guidelines. And of course, I wouldn't ever criticise anyone working within the NHS. They were in an incredibly pressured situation that they should never have been placed in. And, and many of those, you know, have come out and said, you know, they were, they, they whistleblown effectively or, or on the, the use of these guidelines in that way it should never have reached a situation where those decisions had to be made um, but I think it's kind of been heartening that members of the public did come out um, there was an outcry when people found out about the unlawful use of DNRs and also in response to the the treatment rationing guidance that was first of all published um, I think it was last April and, and that was kind of reviewed and something was added to say shouldn't just be clinical frailty score you should also like it should be up to the like professionals discretion they should take into account other factors like if the person you know contributes to society and you know um, it deserves to live effectively um, but but you know there was an outcry and I think People, disabled people who've been feeling really isolated um, uh, and like society didn't care because of this, you know, media narrative that was presenting it as, you know, well, maybe if we didn't have to think about those people, those vulnerable people, we could open the economy and everyone, you know, would have their jobs saved. It kind of presenting it as this, this, this false binary, which we know it wasn't, but for a lot of disabled people hearing public debate about whether their lives could be you know were, were dispensable and were worth sacrificing to keep the economy open was obviously upsetting for people to, to have people respond in that way about the dnrs was was heartening but of course the reality is that those kind of judgments on the quality of life of disabled people happen within the healthcare system continuously it's nothing it's absolutely nothing new i've got several friends who you know judgments were made on their lives and had they not been disabled they would definitely have been given treatment and still be alive to this day it's a reality of that the unequal access to, to healthcare is is one of those realities of disabled people's lives that we live with and we're very aware of but mainstream society isn't so i, I think that that going forwards from here i mean it is very difficult for, for disabled campaigners because of, you know, you had the impact of 10 years of austerity and welfare reform and conditions, daily living conditions, just getting worse and worse and worse. We had, we managed to trigger the unprecedented investigation by the United Nations Disability Committee. They made a finding the government was guilty of grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights due to austerity and welfare reform. And of course, nothing changed. Things just carried on getting worse. The Tories got, you know, re-elected even more right 
right wing version got re-elected, then we had the pandemic. Um, so a lot of disabled campaigners are really bur burned out, but I think that disabled people are only going to, you know, achieve disability equality as part of the wider working class movement. And I think the initiatives like People Before Profit that are seeking to, to um, unite people together are, are really, really important. And I think it's I'm really pleased that you wanted to talk about disability um, because again from the because I think disability there's a lack of awareness of it it often becomes one of those topics that the people aren't actually that interested in I would argue it's intensely politically fascinating <laughs> so so do kind of acquaint yourselves with the the relationship between disability uh, and capitalism and I think we just need to we need to escalate the struggle, the, the 20 pound uplift that wasn't given to uh, legacy benefits is due to be taken away from universal credit in, um, I think it's October, you're going to have the reintroduction of conditionality and sanctions. I think a lot of those people, you know, who, who moved on to universal credit um, as you know who haven't had it you know great have been a lot of people have been quite shocked by how little the payments are despite the 20 pound uplift uh, i i think as the aspects of universal credit are more punitive get switched back on i think people are going to have a bit of a an awakening to the perversity and the cruelty of the wider system and i, I think now is the time to to try and harness people um so that we can all fight together for for a society run in the interests of people not profit thank you Thank you very much indeed for that, Ellen. That's, um, that's kind of blown me away a little bit. <laughs> I've got to be honest. I mean, I, 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 like, I like to think, I, I sort of try and keep up with stuff, but there was so much information in there that, you know, I hadn't even thought about it in those aspects. Now, I mean, I, I'm a parent of a, a daughter who's deaf, so I've got a little understanding of, of what it's like uh, for, for people with disability or disabled people. <laughs> I'll get it right That's on. different though. Is she, sorry, can I just ask, is she um, a BSL user? She is, yes. So she's deaf, not disabled then. Big dears. Yeah, no, 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 that's, that's <laughs> right. I'll get that. I understand that. Yeah. It's, more, it's more of a barrier than a disability. It's no, uh, linguistic and cultural minority. Right, okay. Deaf BSL users get very cross if you call them disabled, whereas yeah, deafened yeah. and mm -hmm. hard of hearing um, yeah. people are disabled yeah, yeah. I, and that's why people it's a bit of a minefield sure no, yeah. my deaf friends would have been cross if I hadn't mentioned that sorry that's fine <laughs> well we we've we've come across a, a couple a couple of issues uh one that was very disappointing actually was uh, when she applied to go to university to be a social worker and she was so appalled by the University of Kent and the way they treated her on the on the um information days and that that she said you know I don't want to I don't want to learn there and, and and she dropped out of it. I mean, she's she's got she's actually a BSL teacher now. She's doing fine, but it was really it was really disappointing. So I, I I've seen it. I mean, I've I've not suffered from it obviously, but I I've seen some of that discrimination and and a lot of it is is fear. A lot of it's lack of understanding, and um, and actually it's just too difficult. You know, so I'd rather not think about it. But but thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions later. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to uh, Kate Belmonte, get that right, uh, who is uh, from uh, Medway Green Party. Kate. Thanks, Ivor. Um, that was awesome, Ellen. Thank you. Like so many elements of my own thoughts over the last year or so just perfectly brought together. Um, yeah, so I'm part of Medway Green Party um, and I also started a mutual aid at the very beginning of lockdown on the 14th of March because I was a shielder um, and I was concerned about people that were shielding and being able to provide them with support um, and friendship and it's, it went really well. We helped lots of people across Medway and we have some fantastic volunteers and we are now going through the next stage of trying to work our way forward and how we'll work within the community. I've never specifically talked about disability. Um, I do have a disability um, and it has limited parts of my life um, but also enhanced other parts of my life um, and I think I have a, a kind of unique uh, view on it because what I have um, which is a mouthful, it's psoriatic arthritis, and it can go into remission. So over since being 13, when it first started, I have experienced 
normality, shall we say. And at one point I was kickboxing and running and doing absolutely everything. Now I'm using a chair to get about um, and my mobility is not great. My stability is not great. Um, and I also have, some, because it's autoimmune, I have other autoimmune diseases that have decided to come in, you know, to the gang and play. So, yeah, it has been interesting um, through lockdown um, because obviously I've been trapped inside, looking outside, just trying to sort of, work out what is going on out there and some of the things that I have seen on social media have truly sickened me to the point where like you said Ellen that that it was okay if disabled people died or it was okay because you know they're not they're not real people so it doesn't really matter you know that they're not working 40 40 hour weeks well some of us are working 40 hour weeks thank you um, and some of us are working far more than 40 hour weeks and some of us have to work 40 hour weeks because of our costs being higher than other people um, personally, financially, before lockdown, my husband would go to Aldi and buy a £50 shop for the week for myself and my two kids. And um, after lockdown started, that was knocked on its head because he had to stay in with me because we what I'm on was, you know, going to be really risky if I caught it. So we had to start buying from anywhere that we could get. Um, which often meant, you know, using all the different shops. And our bill was suddenly £100 a week. So it's an extra 50, you know, 50% increase, 100% increase. Um, and the food parcels that were eventually started to be distributed. Um, I didn't need mine because financially we were, we were able to afford the shopping, but I still requested it. And we then passed that on to other groups in Medway that we were working with. Um, because it wasn't just disabled people that were financially struggling at the start of lockdown, it was everyone anyway. Uh, and the food that you were given um, was very basic. It was uh, very cheap. Uh, and if like me, you struggle with, and if I was living on my own, I couldn't have peeled the vegetables that were given to me. Um, I would find it very difficult to cook with them. So how do I know that someone's getting the care that they need and we didn't? And through lockdown, we've come across a lot of people um, from all ranges, all ranges of, of, of conditions, disabilities, um, learning difficulties. And what we've seen is we don't understand how these people were actually able to function properly in society because they weren't already receiving the help that was then taken away even more during lockdown. So we've got a situation where we've got lots of people that are hurting deep down mentally and physically, and they're forgotten about. Um, so with, with um, I started road reps and with a, a gentleman called Sat, he started a mutual aid and we combined. Um, and we put a letter through every door of every house in Medway that we could physically access. Um, there were elements of flats that we couldn't get into. Um, I obviously wasn't out delivering, but we had lots of people came forward. And that was because when for most lower middle class to upper middle class people are put on furlough and they no longer have to, cons to worry about earning that money to pay their bills. They have all this brain space to think about everyone else in, in the community. And they came forward. We, at our highest point, we had nearly 300 volunteers from across Medway who were happy to do anything for anyone. And unfortunately, as people have returned to work, the numbers have decreased and they don't care any less. It's just, they haven't got that space in their mind to worry about other people when they're, you know, they're working two jobs themselves because most of the poor are working poor. They're still having to go out and pay the bills and earn the money to pay the bills, but they've also got, you know, they're not earning enough because of working tax credit and child tax credits pushing up, you know, or reducing the amount businesses actually have to pay. It, it means that things are getting forgotten quite easily. And there was a bonus given out to those of working uh, tax credits and child tax credits are £500. Um, as Ellen said, um, I'm yet to see anything like that for anyone that has been on PIP or, or DLA in the process of being transferred to PIP. Um, and knowing my position where my bills increased, you know, 
by 100% going forward. Um, and if I wanted anything, I would have to buy from Amazon and the minimum orders and different things or having to buy the, the upgraded Amazons that you could get for free delivery. So otherwise you're paying for delivery every time. Um, there are a lot of people that, that, are, that are just trapped. And I cannot see that anything this government has implemented has made any positive impact on the disabled community. Um, now, I personally haven't had any issues with my PIP assessments in the past, um, apart from the fact that every time you have to, because I, I will go on and off depending on my level of disability. So if I'm really bad, I will reapply for PIP. And when I'm really good, I come off of PIP. But every time I have to reapply, I have to go through that whole process of degrading myself feeling guilt, you know, writing down on paper that I would need help from my husband to wipe my bottom. No one should have to do that. And that's where as part of the Green Party, the, the universal basic income will, will change the way that people view money in general within society, because we will make a public declaration that everybody needs a minimum amount to feed themselves Clothe, clothe themselves and home themselves. And people that have got additional uh, needs, those with disabilities, those with children, will be given the additional funds that being disabled does actually cost you. Because if, I, if my wheelchair died tomorrow, I would either have to go through probably a good month or two of waiting for reassessments and for people to come out, because I purchased it privately, or I'd then have to find the money to then to go out and buy. Um, and again, we've bought everything secondhand because of the cost. Um, and we are lucky because when I have been physically able to, so before 2019, I really wasn't involved in politics at all. I've always run my own business since the age of 21 because my disability got to the point where I was offered a voluntary redundancy with a nice little payout. Um, so I've always, since 21, I've been in control of, you know, what I work, how much I work and how much money I earn. Um, and when I flared up, I've been unable to work. Um, but thankfully, my husband has been able to because he, I say he's fine, but his back's now clinging because he's, he's in a physical job. So he's now got a dodgy back and sometimes his knee plays up. So God knows what's going to happen in the future. Um, but th this whole thought of guilt that is put onto somebody in society and you're right it's entirely about oppression because to me my disability doesn't matter it's what I've been dealt with I deal with it I get on with it um and the pity and everything or or the awkwardness that somebody feels doesn't really help me and looking at Zoe and the work that she's been doing you know she's not being given a job because of how she makes someone else feel about their own thoughts about disability not because of what she's capable of doing um and again the going back to to the olympics i felt the same thing i felt i felt utterly inspired that you know that so many people around the world were given the access to sports but i know lots of people that aren't given the access to sports and don't have the ability to to go and learn how to fence in a wheelchair or to learn how to uh, shoot or or what have you um so it really was two thoughts in my brain that are really inspired fantastic but also well now people are going to expect me to do that and I can't do that so so how do I deal with that and also being young and disabled you know I remember I, every, every time I go into a parking space if there's an older person there who generally has got better mobility than me, I'll get a dodgy look, I'll be a... But that again comes down to the way that society has told us that we need to inform the government when someone is doing, I think it's something like 0.1% of all disability claims are actually fraudulent. But we're told and told about it, the disability benefit street and everything else, you know, it's your fault. So we've got to tell on, you know, Kate down the road because she's not right. So you see, you see it in people's eyes. And I've done it. I've been looking, 
Where's the, where's their badge? Why is their badge not there? Or maybe it's just fallen off. So I'll just go, oh, is, you, is your badge falling down? You're okay. And then I often get a, Ooh, look. So we do it back and forth to each other. It's terrible. And it's because we've been pitted against each other by society, which has been governed by a Tory led government. But I don't genuinely feel it would be I, at the minute where politics is, I do not feel that either of the two main parties has, they're, they're both the same coin, just different sides. Um, I didn't, as I said, I've never actually done a public talk about being disabled before. Uh, I talk a lot, obviously. <laughs> um, public transport is, is a big issue. Um, like I, I'm a Green Party, but I have, a diesel vehicle outside because I've got to get my wheelchair to and from places and I can't sit on a train for you know two hours to get somewhere and then try and get off and negotiate lifts if they've got them and everything else that comes with it so how many people in the green industry are going to be left behind and you know electric vehicles are amazing at the moment but we've still we're still waiting for, for cars to come out that are going to be accessible to all um so it's how do we how do we negotiate those in the in the in the country that have the least that is probably going to cost the most to by going electric? Um, how can we support them and give them the tools that, that or us the tools that we need in going forward to to negotiate a greener lifestyle? Um, and how can we? get a government that is more representative of the entire population. I think the, the whole two and a half million shielding, you know, that's quite a percentage of the entire population. So it's about time that we were, that we were all represented in a bit more detail in government. So I'm not sure what else to talk about now, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you very much indeed for that. That was uh, for the first time. Kate, that was brilliant. Well done. So we certainly got the message across. And uh, I, I think between the two speakers, I think that gave us a really good grounding. You got a lot of the, the facts and figures and, and stats as, as well as the personal stuff. But then also having that, that very personal viewpoint from someone who's fairly new to public speaking and stuff. I think... Oh, just cut. like to say, yeah. sorry, but, right. um, the fact that I'm drinking out of a glass without a handle today because my hands are good will be picked up at some point, and that's not right. So I'm just going to say that. <laughs> should, should I cut that, edit that bit out? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm, I'm going to open the floor up now to see if anybody else has got any questions. So if you just want to raise your hand or wave at the camera. What up, Francine? Okay. Hi, um, thanks to both the speakers, it was absolutely incisive. We I learned a lot, I always do whenever I hear people talking about these things. But it gave me a couple of questions I wanted to ask. I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to go fairly soon. So if I don't catch the answer, I'll pick up with another time. Um, first of all, I was thinking that this thing about disabled as though it's something special or hidden, we're all likely to end up with some disabilities at some time. And, and I think people always think it's somebody other. And that, that is quite interesting as well. Um, and I've probably got three questions. <laughs> One is, are there any disability action groups in Kent that you know about or that somebody might know about that we could perhaps get involved with? You know, I don't think it's a case of disabled people not working with able-bodied or whatever able-bodied means. You know, I'd like to be involved in that. Um, secondly, which is a sort of question for a friend, might be for another occasion, um, how does things like neurodiversity operate? How does that work? How does that happen? Because that seems to be a sort of, area, you know, this whole idea, if you can't see somebody's got a disability or can't, or they don't seem to have to do something about it, but they obviously have, then that seems to me like, you know, we're all expecting something, which I don't think we get. And the final question I've got actually is, um, you know, I think both of you sort of alluded to it. Uh, I think there's still a lot of stigma about disability. There's a lot of negative attitudes and, um, I'd just like to ask you, and it sort of relates to what Anne was saying about the social model, about uh, our negative attitudes uh, about disabled people, how does that relate to their perceived productive value? You know, um, so it's quite an interesting 
thought to me. And of course, it's not actual value because what I was thinking is, you know, with probably what you've said, but also with Zoe, uh, when we saw her there, she can clearly do the job. She has the bad, the ability to do the job. Her problem is getting the job, not the ability to do it. So is it perceived productive value? You know, there's no reason why she shouldn't be paid for doing what she's doing because loads of people are, but for some reason she's not. So lots of questions, sorry. Um, so in terms of action groups in Kent, we did probably like a long time ago now, I think like eight years ago, have a Medway DPAC group. Um, and I'm not quite sure what happened to them, but with DPAC and the local groups, we've got, I think about 20, at least 20 local branches around the country. Really anyone who's disabled um, and signs up to our fundamental principles, which are the social model of disability uh, and rights, not charity, um, can uh, set up a local group. I do remember coming to speak at, at Medway probably about that time. And I can't remember what the particular group was, but there were quite a few disabled campaigners like individually linked up with the anti-austerity movement at the time. Um, I can't remember any names, but I know that there are politically active individuals in Medway, but I don't know of an actual action group. So um, apologies, but I will think on that. Um, but if Kate or anyone, you know, wants to set up a DPAC group, that's, you know, <laughs> that would making be very notes. well. She's making notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of, uh, yeah, neurodiversity, um, that's, that is a very interesting one because like uh, I was saying about Ira's daughter and how deaf British Sign Language users do not identify as disabled, there are certain groups um, of people who also haven't traditionally identified. And, and one of those groups are people who are neurodivergent because they rightly understand that there is nothing wrong with the wiring of their brain. Their brain is just wired differently to neurotypical people. Uh, and so an, an idea that is put forward in the uh, final chapter of my book it is something that I co-developed with um, some of you know Mark, Mark Dunk, um, who is himself neurodivergent. Uh, and we were sort of thinking about a way of understanding the social model, which I think for, for people who are neurodivergent, I was saying before that we um, we draw a distinction between disability, which is the oppression that people with impairments and illness face and impairment and illness. But of course, both of those words, both impairment and illness, signify something negative. A and people who are neurodivergent rightly say, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing negative with my condition. So how can I therefore identify with the social model. So, so we're kind of thinking about how to reconceptualize that idea of, of an impairment in terms of it not being a biological deficit, but a material deficit whereby you are materially disadvantaged in society. Because as Francine was saying, of, of your uh, perceived lesser productive value. And I think I agree totally, it's this idea of perception um, actually, for people who are physically disabled, costs of, of adaptations are actually quite minimal for employers. Um, so it is very, very much a perception. But I think the biggest challenge for employers are those groups of disabled people who are actually becoming the biggest uh, components with uh, among disabled people, if, if you like. So we've got... Uh, People living with mental distress is on the increase. Uh, I think people um, who are neurodivergent are also uh, on the increase. And we're much more challenging to employers because it's not a physical adaptation that we require. What we need are reasonable adjustments to the way that work is organized and structured. And because at the moment um, it's a period of, of low, um, low economic growth and low productivity and uh, we've moved away from like a manual industry to you know customer service type work and in order to kind of squeeze more out of workers it's all about kind of like control and supervision so that the kind of the flexible requirements that people with mental distress and neurodiversity might might require a, a kind of 
if you give them to one person, it's like setting a precedent that employers really don't want to give because they don't want to, they want to be able to keep squeezing and, and, and controlling workers. And I think if we look at the direction that the work is traveling in, it's to that much more like low paid, low control work, which is actually really bad for people's health. And, and, and research has shown is actually worse for mental health than, than being unemployed. So um, I don't know if that answers Francis' questions. I just wanted to quickly say, um, with respect to Kate, the one thing um, that the DPAC does disagree with the Green Party on is universal basic income. And that's just because of looking at the kind of the detail and the modelling that's been done, for example, in Scotland, where they've been thinking about feasibility pilots and the because it's universal, the kind of the, the costs that you would need to put in in order to achieve the kind of emancipatory impacts of, of giving people kind of enough money for, for the basic income to, to live on, just don't think is kind of is realistic under governments within the current society that we live under. So, so in Scotland, the feasibility study that they carried out into um, a citizen's basic income, as they call it. Um, so if they would spend 186 million on a pilot that would bring three to 4,000 people out of poverty. Whereas at the same time, there's the, the Scottish government is bringing in a child payment. Um, I think it's 10 pound a week to extra to families. It's means tested. And for 180 million, that will bring 30,000 out of poverty. So I think in terms of the kind of what I would call reformist campaigning that DPAC does and what we're kind of pushing on governments to kind of change incrementally, we're just, con we, we're just concerned that the money could be better spent in a means tested kind of way. And we think that those, the emancipatory impacts that would change people's lives through a universal basic income, we think is only realistically going to be achieved once we're in a society that puts people before profit and if we were in a society that puts people before profit I'd question whether we'd then need a universal basic income so I just wanted to present that argument but but with respect Kate <laughs> no no there's good points and I, I'm was I'm not aware about Scottish politics so um I haven't got enough brain space at the moment so I apologies I'm not up to date with that um I think think the key issue is yeah under a capitalist system it won't work because it will be seen as a benefit and the idea is it's not seen as a benefit it's seen as a, a level pegging for everybody born into whichever country is running it for all citizens um, and then it becomes a moral or ethical question for those that earn significantly more as to what they then do with their god-given rights to have you know 200 pounds a week or, or whatever it will be in 20 years time wherever we get there um so I do understand what you're saying, and I do agree that under a non-capitalist system, you know, a donut system, a regenerative economy, it would be different. Um, going through to, to what was said with regards to Francine and the productive value, the, the stigma of uh, disability in the workplace um, and volunteering in general, the amount or well, the billions that the volunteers across the UK save this government, regardless of our status in terms of having a dis disability or not, um, it, it's another, it's, it's a whole industry. We are saving billions and billions and probably hundreds of billions, the amount of hours that are done, you know, daily across the UK. And Zoe's work, you know, was, was speaking for itself. That if she's there and she's safe and she's happy herself and the people that are, you know, the children are happy and she's being productive in, in that sense, because financially I don't think you could look at um, childcare from a financial benefits point of view, but emotional well-being um, and looking at how schools run. We've got a school down the road from us that is fully inclusive. So every class within this school has somebody or multiple persons who have some form of disability integrated with the normal children. And it is amazing because there aren't children asking questions. You go there for a visit and no one gives two hoots that you know, you've got a walking stick or you're using your chair. It doesn't even, 
my children don't question it because it is just life um they didn't go to that school but not because of that reason it's because we could only get into the, into another one but that that's another story um in terms of um neurodivergence i don't have an awful lot of experience um i do think that we will see an increase in in people with adhd for example and i think i've developed uh, and I've, I haven't spoke to doctor about this, but I find it difficult, especially with smartphones and different meetings and different articles to read and trying to concentrate on things and swapping around. And I do think divergently. I think of everything all at the same time and then have to try and, OK, well, how do I put this into a get from one point to the other point? Because my mind's all over the place. But I, I don't know anything for me about neurodivergent disability. So. I apologise for, for my lack of knowledge there. In terms of local groups, um, obviously there's a Disability Medway network that is on Facebook that shares lots of information um, from different uh, providers, whether it be for those that they have, um, this is where my brain fog is gonna come in now, um, have strokes, supports, um, Parkinson's support. So your standardized disabilities but obviously there's still thousands that we don't even know the names of because it's never spoken about and um, what i have found has been a good thing from lockdown and this has been picked up by um one lady that i follow on twitter is that we've been asking for years and years for virtual network for virtual abilities to attend meetings so as before, I couldn't, I could have luck, if I was lucky, I would get to one physical meeting a, a, a month. And that would be my, because I just couldn't handle it. If I did, I'd then have to take my chair along because I'd have to sit reclined because I can't sit 90 degrees for too long. I've got to have my legs up. So I do think that that has brought a whole uh, freedom to people that have physical disabilities. Um, and those I would imagine that have got, um, Neuro disabilities that that feel the pressure from society to conform in a certain way and certain behaviours, because obviously if you can turn your picture off and anything's going on, you know you're not being judged on it because you're not being watched. Um, so just just uh, in case anyone has noticed, there's a few links gone up in the in the chat. Uh, the pamphlet on universal basic income. Uh, some uh, words uh, around that from Kaylee Rouse, who has had to leave. Uh, International Socialism Journal article. Uh, I've put the Disability Medway Network link up for their Facebook group. So if anybody wants to access any of that, feel free. Um, Jeff, you had your hand up. Did you want to speak? Um, I'll just say this uh, given a government spending review of uh, after most of COVID maybe will will be over. I doubt whether they're going to put any more money and I imagine you're going to face, uh, we're all going to face even greater cuts, aren't we? Um, I, I, um, I was really pleased the way Deepak stormed the um, Houses of Parliament a couple of years ago. I thought it was great. I wondered what you thought the best ways of fighting back were and, and linking with the trade unions and stuff like that, you know. Sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, I think... Um, one of the problems, as Kate just said, is the system that we're working under. You know, while we've got this capitalist system, um, people are not caring for each other. And, um, you know, any system that would sacrifice people for the economy, there's something massively wrong with it. It's absolutely disgusting the, the way that people were treated at the start of the COVID exercise, who was going to get priority and so on. And yeah, what I staggered is the way everybody took that on the chin nobody it didn't seem to be a huge outcry that um should have been and um i think also um sorry ellen said that disabled activists are burnt out because of the current situation and unfortunately that's also the same with a lot of left left-wing activists which doesn't help your cause either because I mean, I'm in various groups and I, I still stay in the Labour Party in the hope that some people like me still in can get back the correct people into power again. Because if I leave and everybody like me, where does Labour go? Where is it left? Um, so, 
you know, I belong to a group called uh, Labour in Exile and Labour in Exile Network, who is a good group that started off of Labour people who've left either voluntarily or involuntarily and um, forming a group to get together, hold meetings and so on throughout the country. And it's a very positive way of staying in the party, but working from the outside. Um, and I think, I, I forget who now, it may be Nellen again, um, spoke, spoke about means tests, but surely aren't they very demeaning for you to have to go through means tests? Whereas I can see that a uni, universal income may be perhaps different, a different way. But again, it's the system that causes the problem. Um, sorry, that was just a few points that I was thinking of when you were talking. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we've also got one question from Hayley uh, in chat. So I'll just go through that and then perhaps can address both. Uh, and then we'll have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Uh, Ellen mentioned earlier about abuse within care homes and illegal use of DNR by doctors. I was wondering what she thought could be some ways to fix these issues or alleviate them as much as we can. For example, I have a friend who works with people uh, with learning disabilities, and they have colleagues who seem completely apathetic to their service users and will lash out at them or treat them as children if that, uh, as if, as, as children if that, if they've tried going to their managers employers to no avail. Uh, what would you say are ways to sort of combat this both on a personal level and across broader society? That's a big question. No pressure there. I'll start a bit. I'll, I'll start with Jeff's point. It was a bit easier about um, uh, Deepak stunts. And yeah, we, we, it's kind of, Deepak has often been criticised as being like really thuggish um, it, for, for some of the ways that, that we go about the stunts and the resistance and the campaigning. And obviously that's not all we do. We do legal challenges. We did the work reporting to the UN. We collect evidence, we lobby and all that. Um, but the, the stunts are really important to us. It was firstly because um, a lot of disabled people who aren't able to mobilise and come out and be on the streets and join the protests, but, you know, they are watching at home and often feeling really disempowered, really frightened, really isolated. And as we know, a lot, you know, many people have, you know, chosen to take their own lives rather than, than, than face carrying on under the current system. And our stunts are really, they, they're designed to be cheeky and to kind of make the people who come on them can feel very empowered, like it changes their lives to feel that they can, rather than being like an object of pity and, and perceived by society as, as being passive, actually kind of feel their own agency. And, and that can really empower individuals, but also, you know, disabled people at home, it, it gives them like a smile and causes them to want to carry on and get involved and kind of join a kind of resistance to, to fight back. And I think that although we've never changed the direction of travel for the, the Tory government in that they've carried on with austerity, they've carried on their economic approach to try and squeeze workers and thereby uh, have to make a life on benefits and being out of work worse than the worst paid job in order to maintain a flow of uh, of what compliant workers into the lowest paid jobs that we've never changed that direction but we we have made mitigated things and made things not as bad as they would have been and I think it's interesting that in 2010 George Osborne said I'm going to replace DLA with PIP and I will cut the budget by 20 percent by doing that uh, and we haven't let them do that. They're overspending on PIP compared to if they, the, the Office of Budgetary Responsibility says that they would have saved more money by keeping DLA because of the legal challenges we've brought, because of the way that people have shared information. And of, of course, I don't want to underestimate the, the difficulties for people who've had their DLA and PIP taken away and not been found eligible. But compared to what they were planning, you know, we've really made them. Um, we, we've really got in the way of what, what their plans were, the number of people they wanted to push off that benefit. We haven't let them get away with that. Um, but I do think that we need to be part of like a, a wider fight back. And that I think a lot of people have been disabled campaigners who aren't in work have been quite frustrated by a lack of industrial action to back up some of kind of like the street protests and stuff we've done. 
But of course, you know, the difficulties with political strikes, etc. But I think what we ideally want is that kind of joined up coordination between industrial action and street movements. That's what Deepak would would really like to see and we'll keep pushing for and we try and use our platforms when we speak at trade union events to try and push for that not that they always listen um the the question about um yeah people with, with learning difficulties and services and i've worked in services like that when i first left university and i found it really just really upsetting the way people can be treated um so i don't think there is uh, a quick answer to how we solve that problem at all. I do think that we need to work more, disabled campaigners need to try, try and work more with trade unions that represent workers who work in social care, because often they haven't been introduced to like the social model of disability. They don't understand disability as an oppression and they do see their service users um, as well kind of it, it it's a dehumanizing way of seeing of seeing people just like is encouraged within the dwp um because ultimately those services are all being run in a way that is not resourced sufficiently to treat the disabled people within them as humans they have to be controlled and they have to be warehoused on the amount of money that you know they have to resource them so I think that that's what we need to to campaign on to definitely try and get more funding for social care and for that work to have a, a higher profile um, obviously this government keeps putting off any uh, way of addressing the social care funding issue and I think that will continue but I, I would like Deepak would like social care to have like a higher priority within wider campaigning we are pushing for a national what we call independent living support service independent living being not doing things for yourself but under the united nations convention independent living is about having the same chance to participate in society as everyone else so we've got disabled uh, people's organisations around the country have come up with a, a vision that's slightly different from Labour's National Care Service in that I have to say national that the National Care Service is quite a paternalistic model uh, that wasn't that isn't particularly informed by disabled people um, as users of the service so we we have been trying to work with with Labour on that trying to work with trade unions and I do think it's about education it's about push, pushing the social model of disability and an understanding of disability as an as a form of oppression at every opportunity we get it's really slow and it can be very frustrating but but those are the kind of ways that we're we're trying to change things and then the just the last point to come to get yeah, the means testing point I think that the difficulty well, I totally agree that assessments are demeaning um, and I find, yeah, my my recent PIP assessment, it just everything that Kate said about it, I was, I was in such distress uh, at every stage of that. But if it was a choice between having to go through that um, and being able to have the the money I need to survive or not having the money I need to survive I will choose to go through the test and a lot of um campaigners in not the Green Party but other groups that I've heard speak um in support of a universal basic income what that when they when they're kind of doing the rhetoric to sell the idea they will talk about how bad the system is now and they'll give examples uh, about horrible situations disabled people have been in but then when you ask them about the model of UBI they want to implement and you ask them about disability within that they'll say well no we have to retain a separate system of disability benefits that's a different question <laughs> so <laughs> well so in other words you mean that we're going to have to go through assessments how are we going to how are you going to test the eligibility for these other disability benefits that you're retaining in parallel to the UBI um I, I feel the way they approach that is quite disingenuous so um I do think all conditionality and sanctions definitely um, they they discriminate against disabled people, but they also push all people away for, from employability. So I think, you know, definitely against them in whatever form of, of social security system we have. But under capitalism, I think some form of eligibility tests is unfortunately um, likely. Um, OK, I'll stop there. <laughs>
Oh, thanks. Uh, Kate, did you want to come in? Um, yes. Um, I don't think um, specialists are given the respect that they need in terms of the PIP um, in so much as, as if my specialist knows my situation, which he does, and knows what's happening, that should be enough for the, the additional benefit to a company, something like UBI. It shouldn't be a case of it being given to a private company to then employ maybe may they might be nurses they might not be nurses they might just be ticking boxes that's that's never been right um in terms of the way that that people within the care industry or, or um people that Haley's met through work um i kind of feel like it's it's about how society in general has been sold this story that all disabled people are sponges um and people do feel that i i believe um so certainly those of of a certain uh vote choice should i say um in terms of the whole system if labor wholeheartedly decided to offer proportional representation at the next election and based on that they would hold a secondary election to get a, a fully uh, representative selection of MPs. And yes, that would include some people from the UKIP or from Britain. Um, but that's society. We are all different and we should all be represented. But Labour won't do that because it will mean that they will lose any power that they believe they have got the ability to regain. I think the Conservatives, they've just amalgamated the UKIP's the Brexit party. They're all behind them now, whereas the left, we've split. We've been divided. So, um, and I know that locally we are working, um, well, we're hoping to work progressively um, with other parties. Um, I will say that, that we have had some very negative toxic comments from certain councillors who who see the green party specifically based on how well we did do in the local elections in in may as a threat so they they don't want to work with us whereas we can take conservative voters and we we did quite well um across the country in both you know conservative and labor seats um obviously better in in labor seats but we have got the ability, I believe, to actually bring some some moderate left conservatives over to the Greens. Um, it, it all comes down to whether we want to work as a team, because we, as a country, we are progressive. We are not Tories. You know, thirty percent of 30 percent has is what's decided on on our government, and that's not right. So, how can we all work together? and ignore our egos, which we all have. You know, every party's got an ego, uh, including the Greens. We've got egos, you know. But how, how can we put that to one side and do better by the country? And by default, everyone in the country, including those of us that do have a form of, of some disability. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we've got one more hand up, and then I'm going to have to put it to, to a stop. So... Uh, Ralph, over to you. I've got it. All, all, I want to, all I want to do is say thank you very much for our two speakers. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that um, they've shone a light on an area which is um, sadly um, lacking in, in most of our discourse. And I think to, to hear two people speak so well and so knowledgeable and to widen our horizons is um, an amazing. It's made, made our meeting worthwhile. And um, it's what we've been trying to do with people for profit to shine a light on areas which are not normally discussed. So thank you very much for a brilliant meeting. Thanks, Ralph. Appreciate that. I've got to say it's gone a lot better than I expected. I mean, I, I knew it was going to be interesting, but as I'm actually blown away by, by some of the stuff that's come out. And I, th I think there is definitely room for a much bigger debate, uh, and, and certainly a much longer debate. We're already... Uh, an hour uh, an hour and 25 minutes an hour meeting uh which is phenomenal 
But for, for, for me, some, some of the key things, I mean, some of the stats were, I mean, ne nearly a quarter of the country's population he has some sort of disability or, or other. I mean, that, 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 I've never expected it to be that high. Um, I think I wrote down here one, one of the key phrases, with political will, it can be done. And that's the key. It's not the money. And it, it's, not, it's not the resources. It's the political will. If we want to make it happen, it can happen. And actually, it, it must happen. Uh, rights, not charity. That goes back to what Kate was saying about people perceive people as uh, being a burden. Uh, and, and I hate the word benefits. Actually, it, it's a welfare. We're in a welfare state. We used to be in a welfare state. Uh, and welfare is not benefits. It's what people get to stop them falling into poverty and, and getting going even further down. So, um, and, um, I mean, some, some of the links I'm certainly going to be looking at, they're really useful. Um, again, the, the language that we use is, is, is so important. I mean, I've always been a massive believer in the, being thinking about what language we use and how we use it. Uh, and we, we all make mistakes sometimes and slip into certain language, but we have to be aware that we can't do that. And, and that we, you know, we have to understand the impact that our language has. You know, I, I, I work on a railway, so sorry, Kate, uh, I'm, I'm one of the people you can't get on the train. <laughs> um, but I've, I've actually witnessed somebody where you've got a disabled area uh, and they're sat there on, and it's a busy train, a commuter train, and somebody's got on who's, who's clearly got mobility issues and there's someone sat in, in the disability seats. And, and they said, would you mind? I've been ever supplied. Would you mind? I need to sit down. And one of them, pardon my French, said, no, no, off. You know, and no, no, pardon my French. But that, 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 that's not an unusual occurrence. You know, that, that's what's so annoying. You know, and pe people have this value on people's lives, as you say, to what they can contribute. But that's because we only value people's contribution in financial terms. You know, we, we don't value what they give to society, the, the families that they raise, the, 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 the input, the books they write, the, the, the songs they sing, and, and all those things that are really important to a structure in society that we just don't value in the way we should. I genuinely really enjoyed this, this conversation. I, I have certainly changed my perception in a lot of ways, and unfortunately it means I will be challenging other people in my workplace and stuff like that. But well, that's just what I do, they're used to it. Okay, as um, as Ralph said, thanks Ellen, thanks Kate for, for your for your fantastic input tonight. It's been really useful, and I think we're probably going to be in contact with you again to have a much longer and bigger conversation. Hopefully, face to face as well, so we can share a glass of wine after. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, good everybody. Good uh, Thanks to the speakers, and stay safe and stay well. Cheers, everyone. Good night.